Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College, along with my co-hosts. Nassau Community College uh, have the pl- pleasure of having Vanita Mathias and Joan wallen Clock. They are both completing their master's degrees in nursing education. And today we're talking about a process called Advanced Directives. Our guest today is Dr. Fern Botto, author of If I Only Knew, Making educated medical decisions as we navigate through life's journey. She is a president and founder of the Fern Botto Adult Health Nurse Practitioner PC, which provides assistance for patients and families with advanced care planning process. She is also an adjunct professor at Adelphi University and at Suffolk County Community College. Dr. Bottle, welcome to your family's health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kukarad. So I have your book, beautiful book, If I Only Knew. And I know that this comes, this whole process of writing a book and starting this business is from a personal story. Can you share that with us? What brought you on this journey? Well, and I, I have to say it was a personal and professional journey, but the personal piece of it had to do with my mom's end of life. My mom's end of life was uh, a long, protracted process. She had COPD, so she um, was gradually declining. And as I saw this process occur, I had conversations with her. But what didn't happen, what, and my mistake became my mission, uh, what didn't happen was I didn't have those conversations with family and loved ones or her team of uh, medical professionals because I felt that here I'm the daughter and, and also the healthcare agent, and I assumed that they they would discuss that with me if there was anything that happened to her. What had happened was um, her end of life was not, the, did, she did not get the quality end of life that I wanted her to have. As such, I started thinking about how can, uh, can I help other people to make sure that they had the quality of life at end of life and to make sure that everybody has that chance to understand what, the medical, what their medical choices are and share those wishes with people that they love. So what exactly happened um, that you felt was not adequate? Was it on the side of the practitioner or was it on the side of the family? Where did you see the missing pieces? There was disconnect in communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no communication. What had happened was my my uh, my mother was in, uh, she lived in uh, another part of the country. She lived in Las Vegas. And um, my, I, I don't know necessarily if she had a conversation with my, um, my aunt who happened to be living near her. Um, about that, I was the chosen healthcare agent, but my at her end of life, my aunt, unknowing and un- not understanding what my mother's choices were, had her resuscitated, despite the fact that she had a DNR order in place and I was her healthcare proxy. And the doctors honored my did not honor my mother's wishes, but honored the wishes of this other family member. I guess assuming that this was what she wanted. So since your mother inspired you to write this book, what should we know about end of life so that we can make it easier for our families? Um, well, from the, I think it's very important that we have these conversations and normalize this conversation as framing it as a part of life. Uh, what do you, how do you want to live versus what do you want to do upon your, at, at your death? We often talk about allocation of money. We talk about allocation of resources, but we never talk about how do you want to live? What's your, if you, if something happened to you, would this be an acceptable quality of life for you? Right. Nobody wants to talk about the death aspect of it towards the end. Why do you think that's so hard to talk about death? I mean, why do you think that people have such, they can talk about money, 
you could talk about everything personal, but when it comes down to death, it's such um, sort of like a topic that's put to the side or it's taboo. Yeah. Why do you think that? Um, You know, I think it's the idea. uh, I think it's so personal and so emotional and um, it's, it's also cultural. Many cultures don't, uh, it's almost, if you talk about it, then it'll happen. Yeah. And we don't want that to happen. So therefore we shouldn't talk about it because we're, we're talking it into existence. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think that there's a cultural piece to it. I think that it's, uh, uh, there's superstition, um, though even we, even if we deny superstition, there's still an undertone of it. Um, it, it's painful. It's almost like if I talk about it, I'm pushing myself more towards it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we exactly. see similar things with, you know, uh, um, women going to get themselves checked for breast cancer. They rather mm-hmm. not um, get the diagnostic test because they feel that what, a, what if. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe it's that what if syndrome that happens. Um, Joan has a question for you. Great. Dr. Barlow, as we are talking today about advanced directives, what would you want to tell our listeners what an advanced directive is? An advanced directive is a document. It's There's one of two documents, actually, that we use. Um, there are legal documents that allow one document, the healthcare proxy, allows you to appoint someone to make medical decisions in the event you are not able to make those medical decisions for yourself. Um, the living will, and that it goes into effect, the healthcare proxy, just before I, let me take a step back, the healthcare proxy goes into effect when you're not able to make medical decisions for yourself. The other document, the other advanced directive document is the healthcare proxy. I mean, the living will. The living will allows you to document what your wishes are. But that document goes into effect when you are in a terminal or persistent vegetative state. In terms of what I would like the listeners to know is that the healthcare proxy is really a document that allows this person the autonomy to make decisions on your behalf. And you don't have to necessarily tell them exactly what you want because there are situations that may arise that you may not even have considered. So maybe when you're considering who you want to make decisions for yourself, perhaps you want to choose someone that has similar decisions to you, make it like an, um, similar views on end of life that you do. Make it like, if you're choosing someone, make it like an interview and make sure this person is going to actually do what you want them to do with regards to your choices about end of life care. So let's make some distinctions about the differences between healthcare proxy and living will. So you're saying that a healthcare proxy are for those individuals who cannot make healthcare decisions for themselves and they appoint someone who can speak on their behalf. Is that correct? That's correct. So a living so, they, so they're doing it in advance. So before they lose the ability to make decisions for themselves, they say that they're going to choose this person, this family member, this friend to make those decisions on their behalf. And that can be relevant to anything. DNR, do not resuscitate, do not intubate, do no artificial um, feeding, no nutrition. Um, it could be any aspect of health care. They can make any and all of those decisions for this person. How, at, however, it's not an order. So understand this is a legal document. So you're, you're legally allowed to have the conversation with a medical practitioner. If you are the, the appointed health care proxy, the health care agent, the person, you can make decisions on that patient's behalf. However, you're having a discussion, not necessarily uh, that this is going to be executable at this point in time. You're having a discussion with the healthcare practitioner. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, and I'm joined by Vanita Mathias and Joan Wallen Clark, who are nurses also and completing their master's degree in nursing education. And today we're talking with Fern Botto, Dr. Fern Botto, about advanced directives and her book, If I Only Knew, Making Educated Medical Decisions as We Navigate Through Life's Journey. 
So, Dr. Botto, I just wanted to revisit the health care proxy. So you're saying that the agent um, who is speaking on behalf of the patient, it is not something that is um, a doctor's order per se. It is a conversation that the agent has with the health care provider. Is that correct? That is correct. It is not a medical order. It is a legal document. Um, so it is it is permitting, legally permitting this person, this agent, the one that if it was me as the, uh, if I'm the patient, I am, I am appointing this person to make decisions on my behalf. They're making the decision in collaboration with the practitioner. One key point here is that there, I can make these decisions far in advance. I can, this document never goes out of style. It does not, um, it does not expire unless I document on that document that I want it to expire at, on X date. So it is a legal document, not a medical order. So if I'm making this decision, I, I can make this decision now and, and this may come up 20 years from now. And that document is still in effect. Now, so, is this document something that I carry around with me as the patient or is it so this is something that's actually written that I have in hand? Excellent question, because uh, that's that speaks to operationalizing. And I really um, put a lot in the book about that, because that's a real a component that is a breakdown in the communication system. Um, it can be a document you keep on hand. Uh, what I always recommend is having a discussion about where it is located using a, a, I, if it was up to me, I would throw it off the rooftops. I would, I want to make sure that everybody that is involved in my care, uh, knows where that document is and has a copy of it because a copy is as good as the original. I want, if I go to a preferred hospital, I want a copy on file at that hospital. Um, if I have a primary care practitioner, they should have a copy of it as well. And so if that copy is amended, say, for example, if it's revised, I change my mind about mm-hmm. pieces of who's the agent or how mm-hmm. I'm going, how I want care to happen. What if that provider doesn't get the latest copy i should somebody should have a copy of the latest copy the right. the date will be the uh, the the most recent date is the one that should be in effect and it is notarized no it is not notarized it is actually signed by two uh, in new york state it does not require a notary and it, it just needs to be signed by two witnesses and if i was say uh if i had completed this in the hospital it could be two of the nurses could witness it or a family member, as long as they're not the person that's uh, appointed as the agent. Now, the person with this health care proxy, the proxy is only speaking if that patient cannot speak for themselves. That's correct. Um, now, versus a living will, tell me the difference again. Um, you the mentioned will- the word terminal vegetative state. Define that for me. Terminal, um, by definition, is six months or less to live. However, you are uh, what the research shows is that practitioners tend to be very generous in the amount of time that we that we're expected to be left on this earth. So terminal is um, a very it's it's a very uh, dynamic so, yeah. terminology. Yeah. What often happens is that the uh, um, that terminal is more uh, imminent, and that mm-hmm. that's where it usually goes into effect. Persistent vegetative state. Uh, speaks to a time where uh, you have b- minimal brain function. Mm-hmm. So if you were um, a patient and were recommending um, the best advanced directive between the two, the living will or the healthcare proxy, what would you recommend? Well, you can have both, but um, I would strongly recommend completing a healthcare proxy form. The living will, um, according to the research, much research has been done by uh, Charles Sapatino, who is an attorney on the, on the topic of the living will. But in terms of uh, the document that I think that is most important, I do believe the, living, the healthcare proxy is much more important than li- the living will because you are appointing someone to make those decisions on your behalf. What I do feel is it, it should not be just I appoint someone and it's one and done. I don't even tell them about it. It is, it is essential that a discussion occur between this, the person who is completing the form and who they're choosing to be their healthcare agent and discussing not so much what they want done or what they don't want done, but more of a narrative of that discussion uh, about why. Where do I get the form? 
you all hospitals have the form. You can get it on uh, CompassionAndSupport.org, which is the New York State uh, National Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, that's our our coalition in New York State. Say uh, that again. Is it's what Compa- CompassionAndSupport.org. Uh huh. Okay. You can get it at any hospital. Okay. Um, if you go to the National Healthcare Decisions Day website, you can, I'm sure you can find it there too. So when we talk about advanced directives, does that include some knowledge about the terminology of DNR, DNI, uh, do not resuscitate, do not intubate, um, et cetera, all of that that goes inside? Tell us a little bit about that, t- those terminology, those pieces of information that we need to know to really specify our, our end of uh, life needs and desires. When if you're talking to someone about your end of life needs and desires, it, I think it's more important to have a discussion about how you want to live and what would be quality of life to you, uh, because it really helps shape what you want done in this time. Because DNR is is uh, is something that is more for the last minutes of life. Um, intubation is a breathing tube. So when we're talking about DNR, we're specifically talking about CPR cardiopulmonary resuscitation, depending on understanding that um, CPR, though it it can be very effective, it really depends on what your medical problems are, if this would be an appropriate action, depending on how you want to live. So that's one piece of a DNR related to CPR. And DNI? And DNI is do not intubate. That is uh, the breathing tube. So in the event you you require a breathing tube, do you want a breathing tube or not? One of the questions is how long you would want a breathing tube for, and do you want to live uh, with a breathing tube for the rest of your life? So that's why I think the talking about the complicated medical issues less is, is less important than actually speaking about how you want to live, because there be, may be many medical uh, medical procedures we can perform on someone, but this patient may not want them done based on their values, wishes, and beliefs. So are but there any just, other components other than the DNR and the DNI that we should have a conversation with our healthcare proxy? Absolutely. But again, I, I really think that it's more important to speak about your values, wishes, and beliefs right. about how you want to live. Because other things that you might want to talk about is artificial nutrition and hydration. Yes. Um, and there's many cultural beliefs on this. There's many religious beliefs on this. And even adding to that to that conversation, depending on the person's belief system, they may want to have a pastoral care professional involved in that conversation as well. But Yes, we want to talk about these, but if we're not, if we don't have a medical professional as part of that conversation, having these conversations about artificial nutrition and hydration and uh, DNR and DNI makes it more of a challenge. And maybe having more of a conversation for your viewers and um, the general population, it's better to talk about how they would want to live. Because having that discussion can translate when you're talking to a prof- medical professional about what your medical choices are based on how you want to live. Now, if you're at the end of life, I'm going to add one more component of advanced directives. There are medical orders. Uh, Dr. Gerard uh, Gerard Cook, you specifically talked about, you know, delineating between medical orders and the uh, legal documents, the healthcare proxy and the living wealth. There are medical orders. One specific medical order called the MOST form, the Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, is an important uh, thing to consider it's a medical order that is discussed often by a healthcare professional for someone who is who is has life limiting illnesses, someone who has uh, multiple medical problems. So that would be a discussion that should occur with a practitioner, either a nurse practitioner or a physician, to discuss uh, that DNR piece, the artificial nutrition, palliative care. DNI, um, antibiotics if this person's at end of life, to decide together, based on this person's specific medical conditions, what they would want done. Since they have so many medical conditions that 
the, we're at a point where where our decisions are more they're na- more narrow. There is more of a uh, a focus on what is going on with that particular patient. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And joined with me today is Vanita Mathias and Joan Wallen-Clark, both who are completing their master's degree in nursing education. And we're talking to Dr. Bado about Devance Directives and her book, If I Only Knew, Making Educated Medical Decisions as We Navigate Through Life's Journey. So, Dr. Bado, it's very interesting that um, this is very complex. And it it's very hard to have these kinds of conversations. Where do you... Where do you begin to have a conversation? Where do you have the conversation with your family members? What is the, you know, set up the, the picture in your mind on how you did this uh, with your family members that had this kind of conversation? I'm assuming that you have. Uh, have. Is it something casual at dinner? Is it something that you do at a holiday? <laughs> you know, it, describe for me, how do I even broach this situation? Um, actually, I I, um, I took my lead from Dr. Pat Barba who had suggested that Thanksgiving be the time to have these conversations Uh, because you have a captive audience. Everybody's having dinner. Nobody wants to just leave the (laughs) table. So it's, it's the ideal time. Um, I, I have uh, uh, in general, this is a conversation that I, that I have regularly because it's not a static conversation. Things happen, things change. Um, But it's a conversation that uh, for my family, it's a normal conversation. It's something that we, uh, broach regularly. Um, what I, I do feel that if you're just starting the conversation, uh, a dinner party might be a great start of the conversation. I, dinner, wow. with a, dinner with a directive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because it's dinner with an agenda. It's, yeah. uh, it, you have, uh, you're having it, you're throwing a dinner party. I'm going to have a discussion about this. And I, like I said, I call it dinner with an agenda. I start with that and then I start with normalizing that conversation. Um, one of the things that I do with my business is that I facilitate these conversations for families uh, because I feel it's a conversation that is a challenge and people don't know how to navigate and people don't know how to start. So oftentimes um, I'll be asked by a parent who has a, uh, who is a um, senior in, in their seventies, eighties, and they want to make sure that they get that their choices are known to their family members, their, their, um, especially if they have more than one child, because as it is, if you have a sibling, you generally don't, you can't agree on where to go to dinner. Forget about what your parents want for, um, for their end of life care. So uh, oftentimes I will do, I will facilitate conversations like that. But for people that want to have the conversation for themselves, I definitely think dinner with an agenda is a great way to start the conversation. And then having regular conversations about it. My recommendation is always, well, you know, we have uh, what's coming up now next week. It's uh, it's spring, yeah. spring forward. So why not have it? You know, we change the batteries on our fire alarm. Why not consider having a conversation at that point in time? So every it's every six months, give or take. It's a good time to have that conversation again and just update and make sure everybody's on the same page and understands what your wishes are. Should children be a part of the discussion? You think it um, ch- adult children? Absolutely. OK, Dr. Bardo. And- Yes. What would it cost an indi- individual to complete an advanced directive? Uh, uh, with with me? With Gen- you or in general? Generally. I don't know anybody that actually does what I'm doing at this point in time, but gen- generally I I will charge an hourly rate. Depends on the um, depends on how the fa- what the family's needs are. Um, on as a rule, I, I say that usually I need to, I'll meet with the uh, person who wants to complete the advanced directive. The advanced directive is, is a free document. So that's not the issue. It's really having the conversation, identifying what this person wants. Usually that conversation is about an hour. Uh, and then the, um, then I'm, if they choose to, I usually do uh, one or two more meetings depending on the family uh, that I'm working with. And usually each meeting is about an hour long, hour to two hours, depending on the family that I'm working with. So, um, you know, depending on what's going, depending on the, uh, so usually it's about four or five hours total. 
So do you require an attorney to draft these docu- documents or can you do it yourself at home? I don't draft documents, okay. but the document is, you. they are downloadable. New York State documents are dow- downloadable off uh, the Compassion Support website. I believe it's e- even on the New York State Bar Association, we- Association website. Okay. Um, I'm not an attorney. I'm a nurse. Um, I'm having a conversation specifically about their medical choices, nothing about their uh, their legal, uh, the legal requirements of the document. We complete these documents with patients uh, when we're at the hospital. This is I'm doing nothing different than I would do in the hospital, except that I'm having a more extensive conversation. So you don't need an attorney to do a living will. Am, am I, no, am I you correct? Don't. Okay, you don't correct. need an attorney to have a health care proxy. This you is something that you don't need legal either. assistance, and it's a binding yeah. legal document. It is. It is similar to our consent forms. We do not need an attorney to Correct. draft. Uh, we have uh, our consent forms. They, they were drafted by an attorney prior, uh, and we use those consent forms in the hospital, and, and those are the consent forms that are considered legally binding. Um, we provide informed consent that way. So they're similar to those documents. So if I go and they're, they're informed. Yeah, I'm sorry. So if I go into a healthcare facility like a hospital or something health related, can I expect the practitioners to ask me if I have a living will or uh, any kind of advance directive already in place? You should expect it. Will it happen all the time? No. And in fact, it's not always a healthcare practitioner that's, that's asking you for that uh, healthcare document. Sometimes it's the unit secretary that's asking you. If you're going to a uh, um, surgery center, oftentimes the, uh, um, the person answering the phone may be the one asking you for the document. So if you had to tell our listeners uh, how to get in touch with you, what would be the best way, what information would you give them in order for them to get in touch with you and to reach out to you? um, I have my website, uh, ifiyonlyknewthebook.com. My phone number is, uh, my phone number is on the website and um, it's 646-235-4633. Um, and I'm available by phone or by e- via email, and I'm happy to work with anybody who's interested in working with me on it. And your email um, is listed on the website? Yes. Perfect. Yes. It's if I only knew the book.com, Fernet, if I only knew the book.com. So this, this particular uh, website gives us link to the book as well as your information if we wanted to hire you for this kind of conversation. Is that correct? Absolutely. Any parting thoughts you'd want to leave with our listeners? Have the conversation. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm thinking that that's what I'm getting is have the conversation. Well, thank you for a very meaningful discussion and for being with us, Dr. Bardo. This is Dr. Janine cook Garrard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with my co-host, Vanina Mathias and Joan Wallen-Clark. And we want to thank you, our listening audience, for tuning in to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on Your Family's Health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at n cc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.